I can only describe as interesting times. We're grateful for the opportunity to invite virtual audiences together in dialogue, even when we're not exactly, you know, together. And so I'd especially like to thank Sonia for helping us keep ideas and community aloft here at Town Hall. Tonight's program will likely run around 30 minutes, followed by audience Q&A. You can view the event on Crowdcast, Facebook, or YouTube. To participate in the Q&A, you want to submit using the Ask a Question button uh, at the bottom of Crowdcast. Please keep your questions succinct so we can get to as many as possible. And for closed captioning, uh, YouTube will be your best bet. You can enable real-time captions by clicking the CC button in the bottom right corner. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day, at least for the next week, and then we're going to take a little break. Upcoming programs include uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones tomorrow afternoon with Brenton Mock discussing race in journalism. That's a special 3 p.m. start. Uh, later in the week, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal with Naomi Ishisaka offering a blueprint uh, to political action for the next generation of women and people of color. And a special live streamed recording of our first ever, I'm sorry, our first podcast residency, Life on the Margins, this week's event featuring Ijeoma Aluo. Also, make sure you visit Town Hall's media library for hundreds of events from both the recent and pre COVID past, you know, back in February. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Tonight's event really lands in both our civics and science series, um, but Given Sonia's general body of work, we decided to call it a part of our Arno Matulski Science Series, which is sponsored by Microsoft, KOW, the Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the taxpayers of Washington State. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and nothing here is possible without the support of our over 5,000 members. So I want to offer a sincere thanks to all the members watching tonight. On that note, the funding note, Town Hall like nonprofits generally, has been hit hard by the economic impacts of the pandemic. Tonight's event is free, as you probably noticed, to maximize access. But we hope you will consider a donation by clicking on the button at the bottom of Crowdcast or by using the URLs on the other platforms or by becoming a member at our website. One final point on the economy, too. Let's be honest. If we were gathered tonight together tonight in the Forum of the Great Hall, many of you would visit the book signing table. And so we hope you'll use the link on this live stream page to purchase your copy of Sonia's book, directly through our terrific partners at Third Place. It's a, um, it's a local bookshop, and if you keep it local, just maybe some of the things that we loved about this city pre-epidemic just might survive to the other side. All right. Sonia Shaw is an investigative science journalist and a prize-winning author on science, human rights, and international politics. Her writing, based on original reporting from India and South Africa to Panama, Malawi, Cameroon, and Australia, has appeared in the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, Scientific American, and elsewhere, and has been featured on Radio Lab, Fresh Air, and TED.com, where her talk, Three Reasons We Still Haven't Gotten Rid of Malaria, has been viewed by over a million people. Her previous books include Crude, The Story of Oil from 2004, The, Bo the Body Hunters, Testing New Drugs on the World's Poorest Patients from 2006, 2010's The Fever, How Malaria Has Ruled Humankind for 500,000 Years, and 2016's Pandemic, Tracking Contagions from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond, among other books. Sonia's latest book, The Next Great Migration, The Beauty and Terror of Life on the Move, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Sonia Shaw. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how I came to write this book first. Um, and as was just mentioned in the introduction, I've been writing about infectious diseases and contagions for a long time. And uh, in a way, contagion is a form of collision between people and animals and microbes moving around in novel ways and causing disruptions. Um, as we're all now living through, of course. And so I finished my last book, Pandemic, around 2015. And it, this was right around the time that the so-called migrant crisis in the Mediterranean had sort of grabbed headlines. People from Syria and Afghanistan and parts of Africa were, were coming up towards Europe in search of safety and refuge and jobs. Um, and they were getting stuck in the Mediterranean. There was drownings, and then they were getting stuck in refugee camps, and European countries were closing their borders. And so I looked at this, and having studied for a long time how uh, epidemics form when people are moving into new places, and I reasoned that, okay, these are people from 
um, the Syrian civil war where vaccination campaigns had, had collapsed, public health efforts had collapsed. They're moving, they're under stress. They are coming into new places with you know, parts of Europe, Northern Europe, where it's a very different disease environment. And I looked at all that and I thought, well, this is, this is something dangerous that all these people moving and these populations colliding in this stressful situation um, could lead to contagions. And so I got a grant from the Pulitzer Center in Crisis Reporting to go report on what was happening in the refugee camps in Greece. And so I went there and I was doing an interview with a, a local doctor, um, actually he was a doctor, an aid doctor with the uh, Doctors Without Borders. And um, I, I was asking him something about, you know, the risk factors associated with the migrant crisis or something like that. And he said, there is no migrant crisis. And I was like, well, there's people drowning in the Mediterranean and all these people stuck in refugee camps and everyone's like in an uproar over this. So if it's not a migrant crisis, like what is it? And he said, well, there are plenty of jobs for these people. Uh, there are safe routes to come into Europe. Um, there's plenty of housing. So it's not a crisis of migration. It's not the migrants crisis. It's a crisis of welcome. And as I did my reporting that, you know, that completely turned around my central thesis. I was there to find out. And what I found is that he was totally right that the, the people who had traveled, you know, on foot, fleeing bombing, bombings and beheadings, they had, you know, made it through the Mediterranean, this very dangerous crossing on unstable vessels. Um, but they were not carrying any new diseases. They were not the vector of disease. In fact, if they were getting sick at all, it was because of the conditions they were being kept in, that they were getting outbreaks of scabies and chicken pots, et cetera, because they were being forced to live on the streets and in abandoned stadiums and things like that. So then I started wondering, well, why did I conflate migration with crisis so easily, like reflexively. And it's not just me, of course, this is something that we see commonly in the headlines all the time. If people are moving around and there's migration is going to happen, then it's a crisis. It's automatically a migrant crisis. We don't ask, um, is there absorptive capacity in the places where those migrants are moving? Would it be better for the migrants themselves if they were to move? Um, would it contribute to the resilience of the societies that they leave behind if they were to move? We, those are all the questions you'd ask if you wanted to actually ascertain whether a migratory flow was positive or negative. Um, but we don't do that. We just automatically say, oh, it's migration, it's, it's a crisis. And, uh, I, and I, I had really internalized that idea myself in my own work, which was, of course, all about the catastrophic effects of animals and microbes and people in motion and colliding in new ways. But also in my own personal life, I had really internalized that idea of migration as disruptive and anomalous and sort of exceptional and rare and kind of negative. Um, you know, my, my own body in space, <laughs> I thought of as exceptional, as disruptive, um, as, as somehow being out of place. My parents had immigrated from India to uh, New York City before I was born, and I was brought up in New York City. And that, you know, throughout my life, I was growing up, the people would say, you know, where are you from? And I would say, well, I'm from Brooklyn, you know? And they would say, well, no, no, where are you really from? Which is a very common thing that, you know, many people of color encounter in the United States. But it gives you this sense of like, oh, I, I don't belong here. I'm, I'm somehow out of place. and you get the same thing. I got the same thing when I would go back to India to visit my relatives. They were all too happy to tell me all the ways in which I ate the food wrong, dressed wrong, talked wrong, all of that. So, and I had really incorporated that sense of my own oddity in my identity. You know, I never called myself an American. It was always an Indian American, an Asian American, a South Asian American, some kind of permutation of a real American, but not a regular American. I, I found it difficult even to claim belonging in the cities in which I lived for many years. I lived in Boston for over 10 years. I bought my first house there. Both my boys were born there. Um, and yet 
when the Boston bombing, the marathon bombing happened, I had friends who had lived much more peripherally, or much more peripherally connected to the city of Boston than I was, who were, you know, very vociferously, vociferously saying, you know, that they felt so, so much solidarity with Bostonians because they themselves were Bostonian and Boston strong and all this stuff because they felt that they belonged to that city. And I just had not been able to bring myself, even though I felt it, I felt it would be sort of presumptuous for me to call myself a Bostonian because I never felt like I actually belonged to that place. So the sense of being out of place was very personal to me, this idea of migration as disruptive and rare and anomalous. And so what I wanted to do in this book is to kind of interrogate that. Where does that idea of migration as a crisis come from? And it's an important question to ask right now because of course we're, we're, we're on the threshold of a major new era of migration. I mean, right now we're living in this moment of, of strange stillness because of the pandemic. But in the bigger picture, we have 80% of wild species are on the move. We have more people who are living outside the countries of their birth than any time in history. And we are reconfiguring the habitability of the planet in ways that are going to continue to make people need to move into new places. Um, so it's important for us right now to understand what is migration's role in our nature and in, and in our history? Um, what does migration really mean for us? And so I trace this back in the book to um, Carl Linnaeus who was the Swedish naturalist who in the 18th century sort of set out our taxonomy. He classified all of living things and he decided basically which things belonged in which places. And the way he did that was essentially wherever he found something, that's where it, he decided it belonged. So his, his idea was that nature was an expression of God's perfection. So everything was in its perfect place already. It had never moved before. It would never move in the future. Um, things were fixed into place. And we have kept that taxonomy to this day. It's formed the foundation for any number of biological subdisciplines. Um, and also, you know, really essential to our conventional wisdom. It's why we name things based on where we think they belong. We call them the maple, the Japanese maple. We call the goose, the Canadian goose. You know, these are, this, this is, this, in, this way we name it embeds an idea about history and where these things belong in the natural order. And we teach that to our kids from the very youngest, you know, from the very earliest days with our little maps of animals where, you know, the camel is, stands for Middle East and the kangaroo stands for Australia and the bear stands for North America as if those animals in those places are one and the same thing, that they've never moved anywhere, <laughs> they aren't from anywhere else, that's where they belong. So there's a sense of a natural order that is very still. And Linnaeus also created that kind of taxonomic structure um, for our humans. And he decided that the people of Africa, the people who lived in Europe, the people who lived in the Americas, people who lived in Asia, that we were all separate subspecies, that we were biologically alien to each other. And he created this taxonomy basically color coded by continent that there was a subspecies of Africans, a subspecies of Asians, of Americans, and of Europeans. And when you, when I started to dig into how he came up with these ideas, I mean, it was, it was really very striking because he, he was a notorious homebody. So he actually never left Sweden or never went very far from Sweden. He couldn't, he couldn't manage it if people spoke languages other than Sweden, Swedish. He looked down on that. So he relied very heavily on travel logs, travel accounts, um, explorers, diaries, and things like that. And this, this material was actually not so much eyewitness accounts as really a mix of you know, gossip and you know, third-hand folklore and legends and basically some just made up stuff. So there were stories about uh, men in Borneo who were yellow and who had tails as long as cats, um, of African women with bizarre genital formations that like went all the way down to their knees. Um, this is you know, all taken by Linnaeus as fact, and he used that 
to create his human taxonomy, where he said we the human species was split into these four different subspecies. And of course, that really uh, obscured our common origin. And with, with that, our shared migra migratory history, because of course, the reason why we are dispersed around the planet and yet all the same, all have the same origin is because we've migrated around. But he basically erased that in his, in his, in the way he characterized human diversity. And we've really minimized the role and scope of migration in nature and in history ever since. And there's many examples of this that I go through in the book. I'll just give one, one little one, which is um, the mystery of how people migrated to the Polynesian islands. Of course, the Polynesian islands are in the middle of the Pacific. They're very far from any landmass. And when the first European explorers got there, um, you know, they, it was very difficult for James Cook, for example, to get to the Polynesian Islands. It took all the latest navigational, you know, techniques and huge crews and fancy boats and all this stuff. Well, when he got there, he was very confused to find that there was people already there. And to his eyes, they didn't have any of the modern technology he had, this wonderful navigational technology he had. They just had what he called Stone Age technology. And so it was a big mystery. How did these people get here? And, you know, the, the people themselves had an explanation. You know, they said, well, you know, there was a series of ancient migrations in prehistoric times, and we came over from Asia by canoe, and it took many generations, and that's how we all got here. And that's why we all kind of have similar languages, and we look kind of similar. And um, European society at that time just could not countenance this idea at all. You know, because they thought migration is only possible with the latest techniques because otherwise things are just still like, you know, Linnaeus had said, um, it was only possible with modern Western technology. And these people seemed very backward to Western eyes at that time. So uh, in the 1940s, Thor Heyerdahl, the um, Norwegian explorer, he, he got over there and he decided to take a stab at this. And he said, well, this idea that they came over in canoes from Asia is all wrong because of course they don't have the navigational technology. It's against the preside, you know, the prevailing currents and it's against the wind. So how could they possibly have done it? They didn't even know there were any islands there when they would have left. So he decided that maybe what happened is um, he realized that there was a current ocean current that ran from the coast of Peru to Polynesia. And he thought, well, maybe people were fishing off the coast of Peru and they got caught up in a storm and got swept out to sea and just by accident just were carried on a current just by accident they got to polynesia and so this idea of accidental migration as being the only way you could explain how people could get to polynesia became quite popular he he actually you know there there was some skepticism about whether you could actually raft all the way from peru to polynesia which he then decided to showcase that, yes, you can, by doing it himself, which he did in the um, Contiki raft. And he got a crew together, and they took off from Peru, and no sails, no motor, nothing. They just And they drifted, and they actually did get to Pol a Polynesian island. It became a huge hit. He wrote a book, and there was a movie, and a documentary won the Academy Award. Um, and there was actually just another movie about the Contiki expedition just a couple years ago that came out. It was actually pretty entertaining. 20th century, um, up until the 1960s, there were top geographers who said that migration had played such a minor role in human history that the people who lived on different continents and people had left the city. Uh, by the time they shut down the borders to China, thousands of people in Europe already had the virus and were spreading it and dispersing it around. So there's just like this huge scale of movement going on that was really among other things, among many, many other things, was hugely underestimated. And so at the same time that we underestimate the scale of migration in our past and in our present, we also place sort of outsized focus on the disruptive impacts of migration. And some of those are real, but many of those are grossly inflated. One example, um, and we can see that in the way, you know, the rhetoric we have around migrants and migration, but it's true even for wild species. So um, we think of, you know, the movement of wild species into new places as invasions of alien species. 
you know, and there's this idea that, oh, we should only have native species here and these aliens are bad and we should keep them out. We should pull, pull them out of our landscape or cut them down and all of that. And this is not to say that some of those novel species are not disruptive in certain environments. They, they are. And if we want to manage an environment in a certain way, it's, we're perfectly entitled to, to do that how we want to. But it's also a general rule in invasion biology that only 10% of newly introduced species actually can establish themselves in new habitats. And of those, only 10% are likely to cause unwanted harm, whether it's to human health or to ecosystems or to economies. So what that means is only 1% of introduced species actually cause these uh, effects that we consider invasive. And yet in our policymaking and in our, you know, in our um, ideas about conservation at the very highest level, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity um, says that, well, you should get rid of non-native species as soon as they get there, as soon as they get into a new habitat, even before they've caused any harm at all, because maybe they will, right? So we're throwing out 99% of these species based on what maybe 1% will do. So there's this outsized focus on the disruptive effects. And we see that, of course, with human migrants all the time. It's one reason why today we have more borders and walls are fortified, more borders are fortified with walls and fences today than any time in history. And we see this idea of race as deeply embedded, you know, this idea of racial differences, our continental origins as being so um, deeply rooted in our biology, that idea has been incorporated in, 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 you know, all across society, our entire society has been built on this idea of a racial hierarchy, and that some people are sort of subhuman, or at least less deserving of human rights. And this really goes right back to Linnaeus, who said, you know, African people from Africa, were not fully human. In his taxonomy, he decided that people from Africa were actually a cross between Homo sapiens and this other form of, um, our, you know, really pretend humans, but archaic humans that he called uh, troglodytes, which are sort of monstrous people. So he, even in his taxonomy from the very beginning, and those ideas really formed the basis for uh, the 20th century race science and eugenics and our anti-immigration policies are, that are put in place racial quotas and and is still with us today in the form of the racial violence we continue to see and the anti-migrant policies that uh, you know con continue to characterize much of much of the world today. Um, but the other part of the the story that I tell in this book is that um, this idea of migration as rare and disruptive has been completely overturned by new science, um, which is revealing migratory capacities that are far more extensive and more deeply embedded in our history and in nature than ever before imagined. So we're all taught this idea of our migratory history as a tree, where there's a base of the tree and then that's Africa where we all originated and then you know each branch kind of goes out and that's each population going into its respective empty continent and populating it, at which point, essentially, you know, the branches don't grow back together again. And then, so the, the, according to that metaphor, migration basically comes to a halt. But what we now know through uh, a new field called paleogenetics, these are um, geneticists who have been able to actually capture ancient DNA from ancient remains. They used to look in the, like, leg bones and stuff for ancient DNA. And they couldn't really find that much of much of it. They, you know, unless the remains had been, you know, in, in a icy cave or something like that. Um, but what they're now finding is that finding is that there's this bone in your ear called the Petrus bone. And in that bone, D DNA can remain intact for like thousands of years under certain conditions. So they are they're getting all this ancient DNA and through that ancient DNA they can piece together the story of our ancient migrations. And it turns out that we didn't just walk out of Africa into an empty planet and then you know, populate the continents and then stay still, essentially until the modern era of migration. We were migrating all along in ancient times. People migrated out of Africa into Eurasia and then back to Africa. People migrated out into North America and then back to Europe and then back to Africa and then into Asia and then back up. All, this whole series of continuous migrations even into some of the most forbidding 
uh, forbidding locations in the world, places like the Tibetan Plateau uh, at the very top of the Himalayan mountains where there's not even enough oxygen to breathe. And people migrated into their, those places in ancient times, not just once, but multiple times, multiple waves of migrations. There were multiple waves of migrations into the Pacific Islands from Asia, just as the people of Polynesia said. This has all been backed up now by genetic evidence and linguistic and archaeological evidence that there were multiple waves from Asia into Polynesia. These are people who, you know, went out in canoes into the featureless expanse of the ocean, not knowing where the specks of land are because they're very far away and you can't see them. Um, and they did it not just once, but multiple times over and over again. And it's interesting that we now know too that they didn't have just quote unquote stone age navigational technology, but uh, ancient uh, traditional navigation cultures where, you know, called wayfinding, where um, the navigators would take thousands of observations of fish and, and seabirds and um, they'd lie and lay on the bottom of their canoe and just feel how the ocean swells came up and down and by through, take, through all of this sensory information could figure out like where they were located in the sea because it's very difficult here in the middle of the ocean you can't see anything and they did that not you know multiple times in ancient in the ancient era so that really gives us a sense of well why do we migrate you know, why, why did we leave Africa? We hadn't run out of food. We hadn't run out of space. It's, there's still plenty of all that stuff in Africa. We didn't have to leave at all. Um, why did we go into the Tibetan Plateau? Why did we canoe out into the featureless expanse of the ocean in ancient times over and over again? Um, and the, I don't think there's any simple answer to it, except we can look at uh, the broader picture of the role migration has played in nature. And we see that more clearly now with another revolution in um, how we can understand animal movement through GPS and solar technology, which has allowed scientists to track animal movements continuously over the course of their lifetime, wherever they might go. And that is really something new. And what we're finding is that wild species are moving in a much more extensive way than anyone ever thought and in more complex and responsive ways than ever before imagined. You know, we, we have this idea about animal behavior that species sort of stay in their little prescribed habitats or in these little borders. And that's why we can build parks for them and, you know, preserves for them because they'll stay in that little spot and they'll just move around inside of it. And, you know, they'll absorb, uh, observe those little in invisible lines that we draw for them. And what GPS tracking is, is revealing again and again is that these wild creatures are not staying within the borders that we've defined for them. They are moving far, way farther than anyone thought uh, was, was even possible for them, that they even had the capacity for it. But not only that, that those movements are not robotic and instinctive. That was another way that we kind of derided the migratory instinct is by calling it robotic, calling it just, you know, inborn, and just, just something you do, it is in, you're programmed in your brain and the bird flies from here to there because it's all programmed in their brain. It's not responsive to the environment. So therefore it doesn't have a lot of meaning. But what scientists are now finding through this advanced ability to track animal movements is that they are very responsive and dynamic to uh, environmental changes. So we see um, mountain goats, for example, the movement of mountain goats on the side of mountains is shaped by the timing of volcanic eruptions. And so if you just study the, the movement patterns, you can actually predict when a volcano is going to erupt six hours before a seismologist can. Um, we now know that the movement of birds, it can di dictate how, uh, and which moves according to cold snaps and changes the epidemiology of outbreaks of avian influenza and other uh, outbreaks of disease. And we now see that tens of thousands of species, even ones that, that scientists long thought could not move, were sedentary and really stuck in their little habitat, are now moving uh, toward the poles, into the heights, and they're tracking the shifting climate. So we really live in a world that is on the move and has been on the move. And we know that, at least for wild species, that there's whole ecosystems that depend 
on migrant the biological connections that wild species provide by their movements. Over 90% of the trees in the rainforest, for example, rely on the movement of birds and other animals to disperse their seeds. So without those, those connections of migrants, um, you know, those connections is what builds the botanical scaffolding of these entire ecosystems that are so important for our entire planet. We know human mobility is really critical to our resilience also. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of trite to say it, uh, but, you know, insular societies become more homogenous. This is just something that happens, and that's not necessarily bad if a homogenous society is very well adapted to its present conditions, and that can all work out really well for them. But when changes happen, you know, if, the, if they don't have the diversity in those societies to withstand new conditions and to adapt quickly to them, then they can collapse, so they're very vulnerable to that. And that's why people on the move uh, inject their genetic diversity, their cultural diversity into otherwise insular societies and are so critical to our biological resilience, especially in a time of rapid change. Um, and you can see this, is, the evidence of this is all around us in our, that we, we don't really talk about enough, but our capacity to cooperate across geographic barriers, across oceans, across mountain ranges, um, it's forged by the cultural connections that are made by people on the move, um, bringing their new ideas and their new uh, their physiologies, their new outlooks, all of that into novel places. So migration in the end, uh, I think the picture I, I paint in this book is that it's really the planet's connective tissue. Um, and it's not the crisis that we reflexively imagine it to be. In fact, it's really just the opposite. In, in, a, in a world that's changing so quickly that migration is, is not the catastrophe, migration is actually the opposite. It's, it's actually the solution to a lot of the problems that we're facing. Thank you for listening to all that. Um, I'm happy to take some questions now if anyone has any. Yeah, so um, just a reminder for those of you watching, if you would like to ask a question uh, down below, um, there's the ask a question button and you can type your question there and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but to kick things off, at the very beginning, you were talking about you know when you were living in Boston and sort of the sense of being out of place. Um, how, you know, given climate change and in particular the islands in the Pacific with rising sea levels, how these communities are going to have to um, leave their homes and, and find new places, how do you see that sort of playing out with um, losing that sense of uh, belonging and identity? Yeah, I mean, I think with any change, there is loss and there's gains, right? So th there's no doubt there's a loss involved in a migratory act. But at the same time, the way we've characterized um, climate migration is as if it's a horrible crisis and a burden that we have to either, you know, share the burden. Okay, this country, you take this number of climate migrants and we'll take, or we don't want any, we're closing our borders, but, you know, stay where you are, you know, because we're, we're characterizing it as a problem that we either want to repel or you know pretend it's not happening or you know something like that. So we're not we're not looking at it in in its full in in, in the fullness of what it really is, which is an adaptive response. Mm -hmm. So yes, sea level rise is a symptom of a slow motion catastrophe of our own making. Absolutely, but the fact that people are moving because of it, that's not the crisis. That is actually the solution. That is the thing that we should be supporting and. What we need to think about more deeply is, you know, rather than saying, well, we don't want this, this is a problem, or using climate migration as sort of an alarmist uh, warning that, oh, if we don't do anything about climate change, we're gonna get all these migrants, and as if that's something awful that we need to avoid. What we need to avoid is more fossil fuel combustion. We don't need to avoid people moving. People moving is good, that couldn't be good, but we need to manage it. We need to manage it as a reality that is gonna happen rather than a problem that we can repel and close our borders to. If we manage it, we can maximize the benefits and, and minimize the cost, just like with any other disruptive change that we, that we want to happen. And sort of tying into um, 
you know, climate change and whatnot. How do you foresee migration playing out in the future as we anticipate the scarcity of resources, you know, especially due to climate change? Or is this anticipation of scarcity an incorrect assumption? I think it remains to be seen. I mean, in the past, I write about this in the book, um, you know, after World War II, there was all these uh, resurgence of these Malthusian kind of worries that, uh, mm -hmm there was going to be too many people and there was going to be a population crisis. We're going to run out of stuff. And, you know, Americans were going to be dehydrated. There wasn't going to be enough water, all of these things, because, and I, what I traced in the book is that a lot of those ideas came out of this sense of people from other places. If they had a certain fertility pattern in that place, wherever they moved, it would always be the same. You know, this idea, this very essentialist idea that, and it was, it was at that time it was rooted in mostly Asian women that if, if women from India who have, you know, seven babies when they live in a village in India, if they become wealthier, or if God forbid, they're able to come to the United States, they're still going to have seven babies. And that, you know, and so is their, their kids are going to have seven babies and on and on and on. And that was a completely incorrect assumption. And, you know, it traces back to this idea of people being biologically, you know, different and not malleable. But in fact, what happens when as soon as people migrate into a new place, their bodies start to change. And within a couple generations, all of the distinctive uh, differentials that you can tell you can you can uh, detect at the beginning of migration are gone. You know, educationally, linguistically, in terms of our health outcomes, in terms of all these other ways we can evaluate immigrants within a generation or two, they disappear because assimilation happens. Um, and so, and that happens with fertility patterns too. So you can't dic you can't make a prediction based on how you know what the landscape looks like now and just project it out in a linear fashion because these things, uh, these all of these variables are going to affect each other and actually change. And a question from our uh, audience members. This one from Connie. Um, she asks if migration is biologically evolutionarily better for humans, why do humans historically fight this integration? Yeah, that's a great question. I, and I look at that in the book. And this, the simple answer is that we don't always. We usually don't, actually. Um, if you look at the broader view of history, these outbursts of xenophobia and sort of you know, hatred and trying to build walls between people and movement is more the exception than the rule. Um, we've mixed and matched so often that in fact, you know, the, the times when we've actually been able to isolate it ourselves and segregate ourselves are actually quite rare. So xenophobia is not um, a, an ever present outcome when two unusual, two groups that haven't met each other before actually come into contact. Um, and one theory about that I talk about in the book is that xenophobia actually arises only when migration becomes um, conspicuous. And usually, you know, people are moving around all around us and we don't notice. It is beneath our notice, like the blood running through our veins. We just don't think about it. Um, and so it happens in the background all the time. It's why we're able to minimize it, you know, in our conscious life. We think a migration that, you know, we don't recognize how much movement is actually happening around us. Um, and so it's only when it becomes suddenly and comes to our attention. That then we think, oh, wait a second, there's a border between those people and us. There's us and them. You know, I can distinguish this now because of a policy like, you know, making people wait at the border to get their papers or um, people, you know, who are, have a certain immigration status can't get their kids into school or, you know, other kinds of policy choices that we can make that then turn migrants into some spectacle. And once you do that, you know, as humans, we we tend to see ourselves as group in groups, right? So, and this has been shown in social psychology experiments where they actually, you know, get just a group of people and randomly split them into two and say, okay, everyone who likes chocolate ice cream is in one group and everyone likes ice vanilla is in the other group. Some completely random and, you know, unmeaningful uh, basis for distinguishing between the two. And what they find is once you split people into two groups and tell them you're part of this group and these other people are part of that other group, that people will decide that the people in their group are more fair or are kinder, are more generous, are just like better people and all these measures um, than the people in the other group. So just the visibility of a border between us will 
start to inflame that sense of who's in and who's out. And I think we're seeing that play out on a large scale today um, because Paul, you know, we have all these populist leaders coming into power, not just here in the United States, but across Europe, Asia, South America, et cetera. And they are coming into power by saying, you know, we want to keep them out. And as long as they can do that, create those barriers in policy that make migrants conspicuous, they can keep that xenophobic feeling going. Tying into that, um, David asks, how does war and ideology factor in? So for example, Syrian and ISIS refugees. Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but one thing I will say about the Syrian crisis that ties in to this idea of um, you know, climate change happening and, and migrations happening is Syria was considered a very a kind of a famous case of, you know, this was climate, a climate linked migration because there was a drought in parts of Syria uh, that preceded the, the civil war. A lot of pe farmers, you know, their farms failed. And so they rushed, they migrated into the cities and the cities became very crowded and food prices spiked and there was a lot of unrest. And, you know, this, a series of events later and that led to the civil war, this like big crisis that then led to this massive migration out of Syria. And so then the idea was, well, uh, because of the climate change, you know, that, that we had this migration, that this is a climate driven migration. And I think the thing to keep in mind about that is that all of these steps along the way are mediated by our choices, right? So, you know, yes, the drought made people move into the cities, but there was any number of choices policymakers could have made at that time to ease those migrations, to, to prop up food prices or to uh, you know, alleviate the housing crisis, or you know, any number of political choices that could have been made that would have allowed those mi migrants to live successfully in the cities and for people to live together without descending into civil war. So you know, was, it the, was it the spike in food prices that the leadership didn't control? Or was it the drought? Or was it, you know, it's, it's really, it's a combination of all of those things that lead to the migration. So I think the the way we would like to think about migration as crisis driven, you know, I think that's sort of the traditional ideas like, well, if we left Africa, it must have been something horrible happened, like a volcanic eruption or, you know, you know, we ran out of this kind of food or some kind of climatic catastrophe. Um, but I think in a lot in a lot of in a lot of scenarios that migration is not you can't reduce it to one reason. And it's, it's a multitude of reasons because it's, it's a migratory instinct. It's a behavior that we have continually have done. Um, so sometimes it's provoked by war. Sometimes it's provoked by catastrophe, but sometimes it's provoked by just the opposite. You know, there's a theory about why we left Africa that it was because of the greening of the landscape that mm -hmm. created pathways that through the Sahara desert, that suddenly there was this nice vegetative, you know, uh, wet path that we could walk on. And so we did it because there was an opportunity, not because we were driven out, but because we were, we saw something new that, that we could do. You know, so there's this idea of like push and pull factors that there's both the, you're being pushed it, but you're also being pulled. But there's just, it's just a, a comp, I, I think the real question is why do we need one reason <laughs> to explain it, you know? Uh, this next question, and I'm, so sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Krishnan uh, asks, 50 to 100 years from now, do you think that uh, nat national, uh, national boundaries will be redrawn? Uh, which geographical areas do you foresee people consolidating to? And what will be the factors for the next great migration? Well, I think the next mig great migration is already happening. Mm -hmm. um, we already have people on the move in ways that are new and, and a scale and a pace and direction that is novel. And it's also happening in wild species. So uh, things are moving, you know, there's always this background of movement that's been beneath our notice. But I think now we're entering into a period where we're gonna see much more migration because it's happening faster mm -hmm. than it has in the past. Um, and how, you know, how we decide to reimagine where people can live um, really depends on our political choices. 
you know, there's places um, that we could decide, okay, that's easier if we just leave, if we retreat from certain places because there's too much inundation of salt water or too much desertification or, you know, we can, we can make those decisions, but we also can decide that, well, some places we could become more resilient. You know, we could we could invest in making it possible for people to stay longer. And I think I think those are the kinds of we have to look at that whole picture to manage the pace of, of movement. I think the pace is what's going to be most critical to uh, to making sure that we are getting the benefits of migration at, you know, as much as possible and not the negative effects is that we don't want to wait until the last minute, which is what we're doing now. Basically, we're saying, OK, all you people who live in the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean and you know parts of Africa that are getting deserved, getting dried out. We don't want you. You can't come. We're closing our borders. Like you got to stay where you're going to be. And so, what the inevitable the inevitable outcome of that is that instead of people leaving when the first you know when the first uh, harvest fails, when the first drought happens, when the first storm you know the first killer storm happens. Instead of people seeing that and being like, okay, time to go, I'm gonna, you know, start to move, move my kids, I'm gonna make this multi-generational movement into the cities and then abroad and then, you know, and do that in a kind of safe and stepwise fashion. Instead, you're trapping people in those places by our failure to to facilitate migration. And so then we're gonna have crisis-driven migration, which is what we're seeing. Then you have the the um, Hurricane Dorian. Then you have like the catastrophic effect that occurs and then people are completely displaced and then they are forced to move. So you're really, you know, we're by by not thinking it through right now, we're we're kind of ensuring we're manufacturing the migration crisis that we've already presumed to exist already, you know. Um so taking a step back, um talking sort of about your writing, um Sharisa asks um, how long did it take you to write the book and how many years of research went into it? Um, I started writing the book in 2015 and so it's just come out. So it took about five years. Uh, I did three years probably of reporting and research for it and then a couple years to write it. Um, and so I traveled, I wrote a bunch of it when I was in um, northern India by the, by, uh, the Tibetan border there. And, um, and then I did some reporting in the US-Mexico border, in the Polynesia, and in uh, refugee camps in Greece. And then of course I had other reporting from other projects that I had done before that all got put into putting this book together. But, um, but yeah, it's about five years to start to finish, which is, seems to be my, you know, my average. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. From all of your travels, do you have, um sort of a favorite experience or, or memory that comes to mind? I mean, there's there's so many. Um, there's, I, I mean, I remember stories that people tell me. You know, one of the most striking stories, which I, I write about in this book, um, was this family I met in Greece who had walked from Kabul in Afghanistan. They had walked all the way to uh, Turkey, and then they had gotten on this horrible vessel, and they thought they were going to die. The engine broke down in the middle of the sea, but somehow they made it. And then they they wanted to go to Germany, and so they, this was a family that you know the dad worked in a nonprofit group, and he was a you know a professional manager of a nonprofit group. And um, one day, the Taliban killed one of his coworkers, and so the family decided that they they thought they would be next, and so they packed up and left. Uh, sold their house in two days for a fraction of what they bought it for, just took a few things on their backs and started walking. And because they wanted to get to Germany, they brought German language textbooks. So they mm. had four of these big German language textbooks. And you can imagine how few things they would have taken with them, you know, this family of four on foot. And uh, But they dragged these textbooks all the way through. The, through. And uh, when they were crossing the Mediterranean, um, the engine died and so there's water coming in and they lost three of the four textbooks. They were just got completely sodden. When I met them, they were in, they were trapped in a refugee camp in Greece and they still had that one German language textbook. It was the only one that survived the journey. And it was amazing to see because 
there's all these kids, there's all these, you know, there's hundreds of people living in this refugee camp with nothing to do. And they're stuck in this dry wasteland, essentially outside of Athens in a parking lot, essentially. Um, and he had set up the, this one guy had set up a school, you know, he set up a little tent and, and all these, the refugee kid, the kids who were all planning on having a better life somewhere else, you know, they're stuck there and they've been there for months when I saw them. And they were using that one German language textbook and passing it around is the only thing they had. Um, so the story of that book and that man, you know, it really, those little, it was those little details that stick with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of taking it more to the present, um, David asks about the current plans that some wealthy people here on um, Earth have to leave Earth to explore space. Is that sort of the same impulse um, to migrate, or is this sort of a new thing altogether? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about that too much. I mean, my <clears throat> my my very strong sense is that we are beings of this planet. I mean, we have iron in our blood and iron in the center of the earth. Like we are earthlings. And so this idea that we could live sort of in some other planet is just to me very confounding. But I think, you know, I think you're right. It is that same kind of sense of like, let's keep going. Let's, there's more and more and more. Um, you know, sometimes that is also a colonizing impulse of, you know, annexing new territory for myself. So I think you'd have to kind of tease that apart of like, is this, you know, is this sort of like, I want to expand and explore and add myself to a new place? Or is it I want to grab a piece of something that's going to become rare later? Uh, to me, it's, it seems more like the latter. But I don't, I don't actually, I don't follow it quite enough, because it, to me, the whole thing just seems like very confounding. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be our last question for the evening. Um, Erica asks, um, for someone wanting to start learning more about the history of migration and history of immigration and migration policy in our country and also just around the world, what sources would you recommend? You mean besides my book, of course? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's many great books about the history of migration. But the thing, the thing is, I mean, there's, there's so many different migratory flows. So I think it's, for me, learning about this was <clears throat> a process of kind of going from one little angle of looking at, okay, well, how did people from, you know, how did people get to the Polynesia? What is the history of migration of that place? And then what is the history of migration of this other place? You know, you have to kind of do it in a stepwise fashion, kind of put together all these little pieces. It's, I don't know that there's a single book that can capture all of the history of migration. I mean, really, the history of human migration is the history of us. It is our, you know, and we don't have one history. We have many histories. So I think it's it's really a, a question of figuring out which which places and which peoples and which historical moments most interest you and use that as sort of an entry point into, you know, kind of putting the whole, all the puzzle pieces together. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, any, um media like film or tv um that you could point to that might might be some good resources uh i probably do but not off the top of my uh, head okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well uh i want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening and thank you sonia so much for being here um we, if you enjoy this event you can find many more like it on our website townhallseattle.org we hope you'll consider making a donation to Town Hall as your support will continue uh, for us to provide events just like this one. And if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Sonia's book, The Next Great Migration, The Beauty and Terror of Life on the Move, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Third Place Books. Um, finally, thank you all for being here tonight, and I hope you have a great evening.